Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 166, The World Turned Upside Down. In previous episodes, we have mentioned that Henry VIII had gone through a crisis over his desire to gain an heir, and how that created a problem between himself and the church. The late 15th century and early 16th century saw the Catholic Church go from its highest point of power to a whole new challenge, creating massive change on Christianity as we know it, and that is still with us today. The Reformation began as a result of years of movement trying to bridge the gap in what some felt their faith should represent and the outcomes of years of chaos, graft, and political power. They saw the church as flawed and not representative of God's kingdom on earth. The control and power of the priest and the, as head of the church in the form of the Pope, began to be questioned long before Martin Luther wrote his 95 Theses. Like a lot of history, the way we got there was an evolutionary process. But the first real burst of change came with a combination of ideals and political protection. Luther, protected as he was from the Catholic judgment and retribution, meant that he was able to continue to gain followers and, importantly, spread his ideals more widely. For Luther and others that came after, the philosophy of faith was more important than the more secular concerns. The body of Christ before the body of man was crucial to salvation. Henry VIII, on the other hand, legitimately fell into the Reformation because he was unhappy with his secular issues. Few could rationally argue that he was wanting to set up a separate church or create a new form of Christianity as Luther had came and done himself. Henry's version of Protestantism was simply a matter of convenience, as the new fad was catching on. Regardless, the consequences for England and Wales were massive in how they changed society, created conflicts that would go on politically to this very moment in places like Northern Ireland, for example, and create constant fear, degradation, and destruction. In 1534, Henry's Parliament passed into law the creation of the Church of England, breaking the kingdom away from Catholicism. Medieval Catholicism in the homes and lives of the average person in Wales was likely small by comparison to what people think it was like. While holy days were observed and mass attended, there was constant concern that the population was mostly just going through the motions in a way not dissimilar from the current secular nature of Europe and North America. There is a notion that was popular during the last century and in the Victorian era that medieval people were very church-oriented, but in practice, many aspects of the Catholic faith in the period did not really revolve around attending church, and in eras where literacy was low and printing presses were non-existent, in Wales at least, there was no way to read religious texts or arguments. If anything, Wales remained largely rural, religiously conservative, and generally content to stay that way. The priests and chief holders of papal authority in Wales were generally appointed by the approval of the English crown, and thus were in large measure English. While they may not inherently matter in most instances, the lack of knowledge of Welsh, the general lack of understanding of the local flock, would be an obvious problem, one that would feed into the isolation and separation between church and her lay people. It is all well and good to be able to speak Latin, which no one outside of a few educated people understood, but if you cannot even say good morning to Farmer Reese down the way, I doubt you could do a lot to make connections with people that you do not know nor understand. Made worse in this was the absenteeism in the upper positions of the clergy. Bishops hardly spent time in their local sees, so often would have no idea what was going on, in part because they were involved in power politics at different levels, be it at the monarch level in England or in the issues of cardinals and popes in Italy or France, depending on this time period and situation. They were little better than those lords who themselves had done the same over the few, last few years, barely even making appearances at their local areas even when they were very early in their appointments. So even amongst the clerical community, there would be an absence of papal authority and direction and control. 
All the while this is going on, local priests, the one who are tasked with the day-to-day care, were either poorly trained, poorly compensated, or uneducated, and in some cases all three. This would affect the quality of those willing to serve in those positions and will likely see better trained and educated men simply avoiding Welsh positions for the more lucrative ones in England or on the continent. So you can see why the Welsh would have little enthusiasm for Catholicism from this perspective. However, even reformist movements did little better when they arrived in Wales. Local, in quotes, heresy of Lollardy, uh, which, of course, is the derogatory name for those that followed uh, John Wycliffe, relatively did no better in Wales. And even European scholars that were spreading their discomfort with the medieval church likely had no influence in Wales. The Lollard movement as a faith group, which grew out of John Wycliffe in the 15th century, the center of its movement was revolved in cities and in urban environments. Thus, in a place like Wales, which was largely rural and small villages, there was not a lot of uptake for it. Of course, to understand the arguments, you had to understand English, which would also be a small problem because the proto-reformer was really only seeking to change some of the important tracts of either the Bible or different scholarly arguments into English, so there was no concept or concern about Welsh. Wycliffe's followers tried to make headway in Wales, but one of the reasons that we've not talked about them is because they largely remained a fringe group located in English towns on the edge of the marches and were never important to Wales as a whole. Their likely Anglo-centric influence in an era of either anti-English sentiment or at least uh, anti-understanding of English likely did not help them make headway outside of those areas. So it must have come to a shock in a lot of circles when Henry's confrontation with the church became known. His eventual decree declaring a break from the church, which had the only faith for around a thousand years in Wales, this would have sent shockwaves amongst those who were likely unaware of the larger situation in society. Your average farmer, your local merchant may not have even known there was a problem. The Catholic Christianity, founded by St. David and others in Wales in the 6th century, had been a bedrock foundation. The monasteries were central points for social aid and key part of running society for much of the medieval period. But that time was passing. With less interest in wealth of the physical well-being of the Welsh Christians and focus on building programs, wealth acquisition, and enforcing the power they had accumulated, the monasteries and churches in general were fat and happy on what they continued to accumulate and think that they controlled. As an example, the abbot in Neath got into a scrum with the locals as he tried to interfere, likely through taxation or some sort of poll tax, on the trading activities of the local citizenry. The abbot's around Wales were often accused of all sorts of crimes, from cattle rustling to murder to just general greed and corruption. The days of simple monastic life was very much out the window for many in Wales. When it became common knowledge that Henry was going to disown the church, Wales was one of those areas which defended the Pope and the church, at least in some corners. There were a number of examples of clerics, poets, and gentry who disliked Anne Boleyn, part of the reason why he was trying to get out of the Catholic Church, and who had felt bad for the young Princess Mary and her mother, who in their eyes had done nothing wrong. If modern thoughts about inheritance had been a norm, Mary might have become the heir with no opposition, and much of Henry's issues would have remained small. Yet, with all of the presentation of opposition in Wales, it largely did not include the majority, and the outward expression of doubt was very small by comparison. It seems more likely that it was a complaint made at the dinner table around the ideas of this, in quotes, kooky king and his idiotic followers, rather than plotting or planning. While they might have been disagreeing with the king, they certainly didn't want to oppose him, or at least didn't care enough to oppose him. All of the Welsh clergy, far from creating a fuss, signed on the new order. Few monastic clergy rejected the order, and all, or nearly all, had signed on to the Anglican way of faith. The Spanish-born Bishop of Flandaf, who was 
one of the few to oppose the decree, was a fine example of what not to do as he was executed for his opposition. Many of these bishops, who were now called to preach the good Anglican word to Wales, found themselves speaking to congregations for the first time in many years. Others found that the language barrier was now a bit of an issue, whereas before speaking Latin through the liturgy was a foundation of faith and thus important, it was now a Anglophone or an English-speaking person having to speak to Welsh people in their language, something that obviously would be problematic. Reminders that Wales for this point and for a long time to come will be mostly a e- Welsh-speaking area with some English speakers on the outskirts rather than the other way around. The new faith was proceeded over with a very modern tool, propaganda. The Church of England hired preachers who would go around and slander the Pope, the Catholic Church, and the priests who followed their faith. They would effectively go out on the pulpit and preach against him and the Catholic Church. As well, they would bring up the heresies and the idolatry that was perceived as inherent in this church. They would make a point of mocking aspects of Catholicism that had been the norm for years and years and years and years. I suspect many of the things being spouted would fit in with the fake news of our own era. This concept that the church was evil and it had to be put down must have seemed very jarring to people who up until now had looked at it as a normal part of life. While certainly they weren't as active in it, certainly they may not have had as strong belief systems, there were still holy days, there were still saints' relics that were worshipped and followed and brought forward at certain times. All of these things were normal things that were used in as a part of daily life, or at least in a part of your upbringing. So... To suddenly have this idea that they were all wrong or evil must have been quite a slap in the face for some. One of the most fiery reformers in Wales was William Barlow, a firebrand cleric who led the attacks on Catholicism. In 1536, he was appointed the Bishop of St. David's by Thomas Cromwell, Henry's right-hand man at the time and leader of the attack against Catholicism. Barlow carried on the campaign against relics and pilgrimages and saint-worshipping and other Catholic practices as he tried to suppress the cult of St. David. In St. David's Cathedral, he would also try to support further translations of the Bible. He also would eventually run afoul of Queen Mary, a worshipping Catholic, and was forced into exile after spending some time in the Tower of London. He would eventually be reinstated by Mary's sister, Elizabeth, living out the rest of his life, at least protected from the worst of things that he had experienced. Having achieved the first goal of deriding the church and creating a new central tenant of the clergy to follow this new faith as created by the king, the aim now for Henry would be to a new and equally important target, what the church owned in England and Wales. The financial holdings of the church in land had always been a bone of contention with kings going as far back as the days of the Anglo-Saxons and Welsh kings. Hey, podcast listeners, I'm Paul Brandis introducing my podcast, Countdown to Dallas. It's a fascinating, in-depth look at the seemingly unconnected events that led to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's based on my book of the same title. In that book and in this podcast, I go all the way back to 1939, when Lee Harvey Oswald was born into a troubled and dysfunctional family. I'll follow his transient and often violent teenage years and young adulthood, painting a fuller picture of the man who would later become Kennedy's killer. I also take a look at events unfolding in that era, like Cuba and Vietnam, and I'll unpack the conspiracy theories too, not one of which has ever been conclusively proven. Subscribe to Countdown to Dallas at evergreenpodcasts.com or your favorite listening app, October 31st. History is the greatest adventure story, but does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? 
This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast, and the answer is that some women were seizing power, or escaping slavery, or spying for their country, or creating artistic masterpieces, while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married, and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever a king needed funds, he would often seek to take property from the church to sell it off. Better that than the local lords. Now all the monasteries and lands surrounding them, which the wealth from them had gone to local clergy and on to Rome, Now that wealth would be redistributed to the king and his financiers. Seizure of the monasteries would likely have been the first sign to Welsh parishioners that things were changing dramatically. Likely few in Wales to this point had really noted the changes. I mean, if you look at it, Henry's version of Anglicanism is not dissimilar from Catholicism in most ways. But they would now see sincere change on the landscape. At the end of the medieval period, there were 47 religious houses in Wales, 34 of which were monasteries, 3 of which were nunneries, and 10 were friaries. The largest of them was still the Cistercian monks, though there were adherents to Benedictine and Augustine and Franciscan friars as well. These houses, by English standards, were all relatively poor, as many of the biggest houses in England would earn as much as the entire 47 in Wales. However, typically the house would still control up to half of the wealth that was accumulated by the local diocese, which would mean they still had tremendous power. During the episode on the Black Death, I discussed how monasteries had suffered huge losses due to their exposure to the disease and in the fact that as well as being center points of taking care of people who are sick, they would also be center points of exposure and spread. All of this would be incredibly important, and it would create a situation where there were not a lot of monks to replace them, and thus there were vacancies within these monasteries that never got filled. Thus, the numbers that we see before 1350 are never met in later years after this. This feature continues for nearly 200 years, and few monasteries were ever close to capacity. Two other key functions of monastic life was the separation from the secular and the charity work, both of which were hampered by this problem. Increasingly, laymen were brought in to manage the affairs of the monastery, and in so doing, these men generally were expected to or did expect to see their needs met financially, but they would also expect to be received with feasting and to be entertained, and in other words, slowly but surely wean off the simple monastic life into something that looks more like a lord's mansion or manor house than it does some sort of priesthood. Also, as more and more laymen were involved in the focus on the monastery as social protectors, these monasteries increasingly waned from doing. Few felt the benefit of the social care and sacrifice of these holy men. Hundreds of years of religious service was crumbling, and many might not more than its passing in these circumstances. In 1534 and 1535, Henry and Thomas Cromwell ordered visits by various monasteries to catalogue which each possessed for the purposes of making it taxable to the crown, or at least that was presented as the reason. Cromwell also commissioned these men, who were to be in charge of these visitations, to ensure the loyalty of the crown and the new faith over the pope. Among these were concerns over the veneration of relics and any other so-called suspicious behavior. Many of these commissioners were followers of a form of restrictive Protestantism and were opponents to monastic life, something that, of course, would make it very easy for them to continue to find reasons to end any links to the old ways. Certainly, if you're a abbot or monk, you can't look at this in any way other than negative. By 1536, the wealth of the monasteries and their positions in this new faith of the king were now in the aim of the king's advisors. Monasteries that made less than £200 a year were to be dissolved, which included all but five of the 47 houses in Wales. 
the survivors, Neath, Strata, Florida, and Whitland, were able to escape the first axe by paying a fine to the government. Two others survived simply because of their affiliation with bigger houses in England. Henry continued in public to maintain that he was not dissolving monastic life, but trying to reform it. However, it was obvious from around the end of 1537 that official policy was now being pushed to see the end of monasticism in England and Wales. As these monasteries stopped, the monks that resided in them were moved out, and in some cases older monks received government pensions to keep them safe and at least in some form of protection. Younger ones were either to become local Anglican priests or educators, or in some cases left the monastery altogether and turned to more secular ideals and matters. For many of the former houses or monasteries, their lives would end here as they were allowed to decay and locals would then rob them of stones to help with their own building projects. They were then, in some cases, sold off to landlords of a different type, many of which were local lords, and obviously the money that was acquired went not to the church, but to the king. Pilgrimages to these monastic sites were now seen as something not done. It was something to be suppressed, and while it remained popular for many, many years after the fact, they were suppressed starting 1538. The monasteries in Wales, for the most part, ceased to exist from this point onward. Unlike England, where many famous am abbeys still stand, there are few reminders of the older times. Tintern Abbey is probably one of the most spectacular ruins that you can see, but it remains a ruin. It might be a best-preserved ruin, but it is definitely a ruin. Strata, Florida, on the other hand, is little more than a few bits and pieces left to mark what used to be a very important holy site for the Welsh princes. Of the survivors, the Penamon Priory in Anglesey, St. Padarn's Church near Aberystwyth, St. Mary's Priory in Abergrivenny, and Aweni Priory near Bridgend are some of the few remaining functional abbeys in Wales today, all of which had links to either Norman or even Celtic pass, though there are few that have been established that are new and a return to these monastic lives has come again to Wales, it's still something to note is that in the destruction of these abbeys and of these monasteries was lost a number of things, one of which was a link to the past with the connections of the things that were written in all of these and collected, all of the stories and and histories that in some cases were straight up destroyed in this dissolution of the monasteries. You know, there's talk of books and scrolls being destroyed at St. David's that we now do not have any evidence of and may never know what some of this subject was or what these things were. There are, we still have, obviously, the histories that we've received from the monks, but keep in mind that for effectively about a thousand years, the only understanding that we had of what went on in Wales and England came from monasteries. Their writings influenced, for good and for bad, the entire history of Wales and most of the history of England. There were few people that had the ability, either through literary understanding or writing ability, to carry out these long documentations like the Chronicle of the Princes or the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. These things were strictly a clerical project, something that we owe them a great deal of debt to, even if their versions are not always historically accurate or not always perceptively the best version of things, they still present us with a history that we just wouldn't have otherwise. So while we pass this time of the monasteries and the time of monastic living, it must be remembered that they did offer to Wales a significant portion of its history and a understanding that we would have in almost no other way. You can't rely on things like archaeology to give you definitions of who the people were, what their names were, what their thoughts were when all you do is find 
relics of them in the ground unless you find written documents, tablets, stones. You're not going to know anything about this person. So all of these things were keys in our understanding of today and are something of a lost age for us. And so it's something to mark. And while you can understand that things had changed dramatically by then and much of what had been monastic life had long ago since stopped, there was still this linkage that was now completely cut off at this point. And in a way, it makes the world slightly darker for it. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can always reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can join us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History, or you can follow me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. And uh, if you are so inclined to help support the podcast, you can do so at Patreon on patreon.com forward slash Welsh History. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have yourselves a great day. We will talk to you later. Take care. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. I'm Daniel Norcross. And I'm Rory Dollard. And between us, we are England Cricket on 99.94. We'll be every week looking at the ups, the downs, the runners, the riders, the news and the views on all things English cricket. And believe you me, there are plenty of ups and downs. Join us, England Cricket, on 99.94.